Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing Israel Gate, Nord Stream, and a near miss on World War III. Our guest, journalist James Bamford, has a new book called Spy Fail, Foreign Spies, Moles, Saboteurs, and the Collapse of America's Counterintelligence. And he has recent articles in The Nation magazine, one called The Candidate and the Spy, another the Nord Stream Explosions, New Revelations About Motive, Means, and Opportunity, and a third called The Most Dangerous Game, How Shadow War Over Ukraine Nearly Triggered Nuclear Holocaust. So not much at all to talk about. Uh, James Bamford, thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for all the work you're doing. Let's start with the candidate and the spy. The U.S. government, as I understand it, did an investigation of Russiagate and came up pretty much empty, but it seems there was an Israel gate there documented by that investigation, but not reported out by it. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The uh, uh, Russiagate investigation went on for several years and uh, came up pretty much empty handed. I mean, there was no question that Russia uh, eavesdropped and stole emails from the Clinton campaign. But what the Russiagate investigation was about was to see if there was collusion between the Russian uh, government and the uh, Trump campaign. And they found that there was no collusion. But during that same time that they were looking into uh, collusion within the 2016 election, they did find that there was an Israeli uh, agent that came to the United States and got involved with the uh, uh, Trump administration, or the Trump uh, campaign. So um, there's no question about that, because uh, what I came up with, it was under the Freedom Information Act, there were documents that were released, and it was a, a, a search warrant by the FBI, including an affidavit that uh, pretty much laid out how this was taking place. So, so your information came from the FBI, but the FBI wasn't publicly trumpeting it itself. Well, these were, these were, um, I guess they call them secret or, or uh, um, uh, they, they weren't made public. I mean, these were, uh, these were affidavits and uh, search, a search warrant that was uh, kept secret at the time. Again, it was only released under the Freedom Information Act, so it wasn't the the you know the FBI didn't come out and say, "Oh, we have this." They were sort of forced to release it under the Freedom Information Act, and uh, they re redacted the name of the um, of the uh, particular individual that came over, the secret agent. They took his name out of it. It's redacted, but those were the document. Those were the uh, that was the information they were after. They were after that person's communications. They went to Google and so forth to try to get his emails and, and so forth. So it was a very serious investigation. The problem is when the uh, Mueller documents came out and the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, came out, they uh, had all that information redacted. Do you know if that was a Senate Intelligence Committee decision or a, an FBI or Justice Department decision? No, it was. I would assume it was the Senate Intelligence Committee's decision. Um, the you know the FBI or the administration or whatever may have had some some say in it, but uh, it was certainly the decision of the of the uh, Intelligence Committee. So, in other words, the entire U.S. government wanted to keep this under wraps, and the only way. It came out was through a, um, a search warrant, but this was one search warrant, one affidavit. Uh, uh, presumably, the government has a great deal more information because if they found out that there was this agent who was uh, sent by Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the documents actually say uh, 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 PM numerous times in there, and the FBI writes uh, um, uh, PM uh, stands for the Prime Minister. Benjamin Netanyahu. And, and so what did Israel provide to the Trump for president campaign? Nobody in the United States, uh, including the U.S. government, knew that the Russians were eavesdropping on uh, Hillary Clinton and taking her emails. 
as well as a, a DNC. Um, so the Israeli uh, intelligence organization, Unit 8200, which is the equivalent of, of, uh, of NSA, they were able to get that information and what they wanted to do was to provide it to uh, the, the Trump campaign as sort of a quid pro quo. So early in, in May of 2016, the secret agent came over to um, uh, the United States and told uh, one of the key players in the Trump campaign, Roger Stone, uh, that they had done this, that they had gotten this information. The FBI was able to determine this because they did a search of the um, uh, internet, the emails that were coming out of uh, Roger Stone's uh, computer, for example. And they found that in early May, the same day he met with the uh, and talked to the Israeli agent, he began Googling uh, things like Lucifer uh, 2.0 and so forth. These were only names that came out a month later in the United States because uh, Guccifer was a cover name for uh, the Russians who were uh, hacking into the, the Clinton campaign and the DNC. So in other words, how could uh, Roger Stone have been Googling these names? Um, again, the same day he has contact with the Israeli agent, uh, a month before anybody, including the U.S. government, has any knowledge of the uh, Russian uh, hacking into the Clinton campaign. So it's a very complex uh, operation, but that's what happened. The Israelis uh, or Netanyahu personally sent an agent over, met with Roger Stone, uh, said, here's what we have. We have intelligence that uh, uh, is very valuable intelligence on Hillary Clinton, and we're willing to provide it for you. Uh, what we want in return is some favors uh, from the uh, from Trump if he gets elected. And one of those key things was to have Trump uh, recognize Jerusalem as being the, the uh, uh, sole possession, basically, of Israel. In other words, not negotiated uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So, um, that was the push all through the summer when they were having these meetings. And finally, in September, uh, after a very uh, quiet private meeting in Trump's uh, townhouse or his uh, penthouse in New York, uh, between Trump and Netanyahu, Trump came out and said that very thing that he would, if he's elected president, recognize Jerusalem as being the capital of sole capital of uh, of of Israel, and uh, he did that. He moved the, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem when uh, he became president. So that was uh, uh, sort of a fait accompli. The information was passed to the Trump campaign, and Trump agreed to do the uh, um, recognition of Jerusalem. And another, I believe, was to tear up the nuclear deal with Iran, and he did that one too, right? Well, he did that. He had already done that. He'd already made that uh, uh, decision and, and made that announcement before all this happened. I think he made it maybe a month before this happened, but that was obviously another thing that was a reason that uh, Netanyahu wanted Trump in the White House was because of uh, his his agreement to tear up the, the Iran Accord. And um, so Netanyahu had two choices here. Uh, they were able to find out that Russia was eavesdropping on the U.S. Uh, campaign on Hillary Clinton. Um, now, you know, it's an ally. They get $4 billion a year uh, from the American taxpayers. The logical thing to do and the right thing to do would be if you find out that, you know, our adversary is <laughs> stealing all this, uh, these emails and so forth from a, a Democratic candidate, um, to tell the, uh, the sitting president, to tell Obama about this. But what they did was instead of doing that, they uh, they told the opponent, the uh, the Republican candidate, which uh, again should make everybody outraged that uh, it wasn't the Russians interfering, it was the Israelis interfering. But uh, the Russians, everybody was going after, and Israel, nobody wants to talk about. So, 
But whether it was the Russians, as everybody thinks, or Israel, or this sort of combination of Israel piggybacking on the Russian spine, uh, there isn't any implication that it actually affected the outcome of the election, is there? No, that really wasn't the, uh, the intention. The intention was not to, uh, you know, get the American public to necessarily vote for, uh, for Trump. It was uh, to get Trump, if he's elected president, to do the bidding of Netanyahu. I mean, that right. was the whole, whole idea. The whole idea was to, uh, uh, you know, they didn't have any power to make Trump president, but they did have a power to make him uh, agree to a position that the Israelis wanted. And it's it's rather a rather powerful case that Israel has influence not just over Trump, but over the entire U.S. government, in that the whole establishment invested all this effort in this Russiagate investigation, and then found their uh, smoking gun in the work of Israel, and then clammed up and said not a word about it. And they still say nothing about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the information is there. I only have you know, a small portion of it. I mean, it's an extremely damning portion. It, the actual uh, search warrant, plus it's the uh, the affidavit, and anybody can get this. It's it's there on the internet. It's there released by the Justice Department. This isn't some guy I met in the back of a parking lot who told me this stuff. This isn't, you know, my information, I'm a researcher. I I don't have a lot of, you know, sources in, in parking parking lots and all that. Yeah. The parking garages. So uh, I get a lot of my information from Freedom of Information Act, and that's what this is. And anybody could go uh, in my book. Uh, I I have the uh, the back note uh, on it, and all you have to do is click it, and you can read the documents yourself. It's not this isn't something that's uh, you know uh, right uh, somebody that was handed to me out the back door of NSA or something. It's a public document. It was released under FOIA, so uh, anybody could read it, but. That's what it says. It says that the uh, Netanyahu sent over a intelligence agent, a spy, uh, to um, um, uh, undermine the uh, the election. Speaking, we're speaking with James Bamford, uh, and you have another uh, incredible recent article about Nord Stream. Uh, and speaking of uh, going after publicly available information rather than sources in garages. Uh, you have a different take from the report that came out from from Seymour Hirsch. Um, what uh, you seem to document primarily that Ukraine and Poland had the desire and the capability to have done this, right? Yeah, uh, there's been a, a. I mean, I've known Cy Hirsch for forty years or whatever. Um, you know, we're friends, but uh, I didn't buy into that story that he wrote because it was so weakly sourced and and parts of it just didn't seem to make much sense uh, there would have been more coming out or uh, there should have been more coming out than what he wrote um it was very weakly sourced and it was not <clears throat> you know well, when you do one uh, unnamed person right as far as I'm we sorry? know as far as we know one unnamed person yeah, right. one unnamed person who seemed to know everything, uh, you know, uh, 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 that was going on. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't meet sources like that very often that know everything from secret meetings in the, you know, in the executive office building or whatever down to uh, what the divers were doing down under the sea and all that stuff. So, anyway, I do my own research. And so, there were a number of indications that this was uh, Ukraine that was behind it. First of all, um, four days after the explosion, uh, uh, the German uh, magazine Der Spiegel came out with uh, a uh, report that the uh, U.S. government, I think it was uh, NSA, I guess, had picked up intercepts from Russia, where Russia was warning uh, sending an internal warning that, that the Ukrainians were planning to do some sabotage against some Western targets. And then there were more indications that were coming out from other uh, uh, leaks that were coming out from the Europeans in terms of pointing the finger at, at Ukraine. So 
there were a number of sources pointing to Ukraine <clears throat> up until this point. So what I did was uh, I, I, you know, but these reports didn't really do any background into what the capabilities, the, the means, motive, and opportunity was for uh, for Ukraine, and that, that's what I did. So. Uh, I looked at the motive, and they had certainly a motive. Uh, the Russians were sending a lot of uh, oil through a pipeline going through Ukraine, and it also went through Poland. And uh, so they were making a lot of money on the transit fees of the oil going through. A lot of that would have been uh, uh, would have ended when they created the the uh, Nord Stream um, pipeline. Um, Plus, they looked at that as a uh, as almost an act of war. I mean, they basically called it an act of war, that pipeline, because uh, in addition to taking their money away from them, uh, it was going to create a, uh, a situation where Europe was very dependent on Russia. And so uh, it would give Russia a lot of uh, uh, ability to get uh, uh, whatever they wanted from the Europeans and to become the Europeans become uh, dependent on Russia. And that was the opposite of what the Ukrainians wanted. So, so the Ukrainians uh, uh, were very much against this. Uh, I looked into some of these documents that came out of the uh, Ukrainian intelligence service, uh, and they were uh, adamant that this not happen, that this uh, <clears throat> pipeline not be built. <laughs> is, is Russia pay, paying transit fees to Ukraine while waging a war against Ukraine and being sanctioned for waging that war? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know whether they're actually doing that or, or, or not right now. Um, the uh, uh, Well, let me get into one other point here. They're... they're uh, the other country that was looked like it was fairly heavily involved was Poland, for example, because Poland had the same viewpoint. They were getting transit uh, fees from from Russian uh, uh, gas going through their country. Plus, they um, had the same fears of of Russia. They they had a hatred of Russia, and they were, had the same fears that Russia was going to uh, uh, become very good friends with with uh, Europe and so forth, or at least uh, Europe would become dependent on them. So they had their own pipeline, though. They were building their own pipeline. It was called the Baltic Pipeline. And uh, uh, that was a pipeline that was taking uh, oil from the North Sea and then going to Norway, and then Norway through an undersea pipeline, again, under the Baltic, to, uh, to Poland. Uh, to make it cheaper. Well, uh, ironically, the day that the pipeline, the Baltic pipeline was going to be opened, and it was a big ceremony in Poland, uh, the uh, uh, president and prime minister of Poland were there uh, at the pipeline, uh, the Baltic pipeline. There was a huge uh, orange pipe, and they were standing there at a ceremony, and they opened it up. This was uh, uh, about 24 hours after the other pipeline was blown up. So, <clears throat> oh, I mean, so. Uh, if you're looking at it for uh, from a motive point of view, uh, they get rid of that pipeline, which was a competition for them. And all of a sudden now they, the very next day, they have their own pipeline being opened. So there was a lot of uh, uh, collaboration between Ukraine and Poland. Both prime ministers, uh, the prime ministers of both countries wrote a uh, wrote a, a piece uh, for uh, 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 Politico, a, a joint uh, opinion piece uh, decrying the Nord Stream uh, uh, mm. pipeline, you know, saying it shouldn't go forward. They should stop this pipeline. <clears throat> and Poland also was sending um, surveillance aircraft over the pipeline numerous times as it was being built. The Russians had a big ship there that they were laying the final sections of the pipe. And uh, the uh, companies that were involved were complaining because the Polish were sending these aircraft over every day, these uh, <clears throat> military aircraft. There was a submarine that uh, surfaced uh, within the restricted area. Um, there was a, a Polish military ship that came nearby. There was a, a Polish uh, 
trawler that looked like it was going to ram the um, the Russian pipeline ship. <laughs> so there were all these indications of of uh, you know the Pol Polish government not wanting this to happen. And um, so in terms of motive, uh, that was a pretty good motive that they had was the uh, uh, all these reasons, the fact that this new pipeline was going to open the fact fact that they were going to lose money, the fact that uh, they considered this basically an act of war. At one point, uh, the uh, Ukrainians said that uh, uh, once the pipeline uh, is in effect, that will give the Russians uh, more of an opportunity to attack us or whatever. So they had all these reasons for not wanting it open. So they had a good motive. Yeah, just, just, for, the, just um, for James, just for devil's advocate, because everybody's been reading Cy Hirsch's report for weeks now. You, I think you established very well that Poland and Ukraine had motive and even that they had ability. Uh, you, you go into their use of, of unmanned vehicles underwater and so forth. But can the same not be said about the U.S. as well? Right. Well, the difference here is that uh, other than uh, Cy Hirsch's unnamed source, there hasn't been any other indication from the U.S. <clears throat> and usually but in something like this, there's leaks. Other people get leaks. I mean, you, they just, that's just the way it works. But is there but evidence all of the leaks who have did been it? From, I'm sorry? It, but is there <laughs> evidence of who did it, U Ukrainians or Poles? Yeah, well, you, you know, the way I write is I can't just go on speculation. So I can't say, well, possibly the United States did it. I don't do possibilities. Of course. I, I say that uh, here's what we have. There's all these uh, indications from uh, leaks from the uh, investigators in Europe saying uh, uh, Ukraine's involved and so forth. Uh, uh, and um, so there were there's a number of indications from uh, real sources uh, that the Ukrainians involved are involved, but there hasn't been any leaks from real sources that the U.S. is involved. So, uh, you know, that's Sai. If Sai wants to uh, tell that story, that's his story. I, but I have to, I'm not telling that story. I'm telling this story. This story shows means, motive, and opportunity for Ukraine. Whether the U.S. helped or not, I have no idea. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, and maybe that'll say... come out later or, or not. I'm just saying that, you know, when you do an investigation, you need more than one source. And really, I always do everything for a publication. It's for a magazine, it's for a book. Sure. I got editors and fact checkers. And uh, I mean, they tear my pieces apart. You know, where did this come from? Where did this come from? Where did this come from? You don't have that with Substack. Substack sure. is like uh, everybody going to their own little uh, cubby hole writing up their own little thing and 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 ho holding it out the door it's uh, there is no fact checking there is no uh second people uh, people second guessing it or, or anything like that I, you know i've yeah. never lived in that life i've always spent 10 years with abc news i've written for new york times washington post you know, i mean there's hardly a magazine i haven't written for uh, i've done five books so uh, and they've all been very very controversial books so i've had numerous lawyers and numerous fact checkers going over every word. So that's why I've never had anybody uh, I believe the New York say Times been wrong. I believe the New York Times was speculating that Russia did it. Um, it yeah, and that, that's what I, I was uh, saying is that, that that's the, the problem here is that the uh, you know it's this whole atmosphere since Russiagate, it's always the first thing you do is you blame Russia for everything. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I don't. I blame the New York Times uh, entirely for for doing those kind of things, and the Washington Post also. If, in my book, I take take them over the coals for what they did yeah. in RussiaGate. I have a huge section on on why RussiaGate was such a, a debacle for the American press. Uh, when you say I'm you an agree. outsider, so I don't I don't have to worry about that. I I just write for books, and I write for whoever magazine wants me to write for them. <laughs> but, but when you say Ukraine, just to be clear, you mean the Ukrainian government as opposed to the U.S. government's line that it was some Ukrainians, but they had nothing to do with the Ukrainian government. Right. Yeah. A lot of times that's a euphemism for uh, uh, an, an intelligence organization, you know, a corporate operation by an intelligence organization. <clears throat> yeah.
I mean, this is too complicated an operation just for some freelancer or something. Uh, but then I get into the uh, <clears throat> the means uh, in terms of uh, Ukraine. You know, people think, oh, it's Ukraine. I mean, there are a long ways from uh, the uh, the pipeline. Well, <clears throat> you know, it turns out that the uh, Ukrainians are extremely sophisticated when it comes to uh, undersea uh, drone activities, undersea warfare. They uh, they've developed a, a, a undersea drone, for example, that carries eleven thousand pounds of uh, of explosives. Um, it's a, you know this is a country that's on the Black Sea. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they've been involved with uh, Russia uh, this war for you know going on a year now, and they um, uh, or over a year now, and and. Uh, one of the things they did was attack uh, the Russian ships uh, off Crimea, and they used uh, undersea weapons for that. So they have an undersea capability, a large undersea capability. They have one um, uh, drone that they're uh, that they have that, like I said, can carry eleven thousand pounds worth of uh, 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 um, explosives. They have another one. It's a it's one step down it can carry 1100 pounds of of explosives and nato has said that uh, the uh, amount of explosives that were needed to blow up the pipeline was 1100 pounds mm -hmm. uh so so they've got the the means they've got the undersea capability and they also had the opportunity you know ironically at the same just Two months before, uh, uh, or I think less than two months before the explosion, uh, the um, uh, NATO, uh, British uh, Navy, and and the U.S. were training the Ukrainians in the use of undersea warfare, drones, and so forth in that very area uh, of the uh, of the of the pipeline uh, off uh, off the island where the pipeline was uh, was laid so so they had the means uh, uh, and the they had the motive means and opportunity uh, right. in addition to that they <laughs> the Brits gave the the uh, Ukrainians six drones the sort of a going away gift and they the head of the Navy in Britain said I you know hope you do good against the Russians or something like that and uh, and here, you know, uh, one minute time later, it's uh, it gets blown up. There's been a lot of talk of this uh, 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 yacht that was used, and a lot of the discussion about the yacht was that well, it couldn't be used because you can't put a a uh, uh, decompression chamber on there, and you can't bring all these thousands of pounds of uh, explosives on there, and you need all these people with the divers and all that. Well, yeah, that's fine, but. That's probably not how they did it. They did it with a drone, and all you'd need uh, that drone that I just mentioned that had the 1,100 pounds of explosives is listed as a two-man drone. In other words, two people can carry it. I mean, you know, there's pictures of it. I, I'm not sure yeah. if there's a picture in my article, but it's easy to I identify the drone. You could easily take a, a look at it. It could be carried on. You just put it in the ocean or put it in the, the uh, Baltic Sea, um and then it's a uh, you know autonomous i mean you control it with a laptop computer so you know right. you're not talking about a, a decompression outfit the, uh, these drones have uh, the first drone had 2000 kilometer distance as 30 uh, 30 hours under the under the sea it could go way down to the uh, way below what the distance was for the pipeline. So it had all the capabilities of, of doing that. Plus the way that uh, when you're teaching undersea um, warfare, the way you do it. Um, 10 seconds. Huh? 10 seconds. Oh, sorry. yeah. You, you, you want to put a, you want to put the, uh, uh, the drone next to the uh, mine and blow it up. Well, that's the way you would blow up a pipeline. You put the explosive drone next to the pipeline and blow it up. So, uh, so those are my theories about what possibly happened and I identified whatever sources I had in my article. I wish we could continue. We've been speaking with James Bamford. We'll put links up to his articles at the Nation Magazine at talkworldradio.com. 
org. Uh, we are uh, of all topics failing to get to the topic of nearly causing World War Three, uh, <laughs> but, but we do have the world's A nation. minor topic, yeah. <laughs> dead set on on getting there anyway. So uh, go to the Nation Magazine, James Bamford. Thank you very very much for coming on Talk World Radio. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.